Check this out, I'm way better at this now, I promise. Mmm. Lovely. Alright, so I came in early on a Saturday because I need to get some stuff done on my bus, which is almost completely built out the way that I want it to be. It's getting really close. And it's always cool to come by the office when there's no one else here. And Saturday, sometimes we work on Saturday if we're doing a production or something like that, but typically no one's here on a Saturday. So I can like walk through all the different parts of the stage five building, stage two, and even stage four where Achievement Hunter and the sales guys are, and there's just nobody around. It's just, it's really weird to see these places that I normally associate with these huge personalities that occupy these spaces, and then to see those places without those people in them. It's just a new weird perspective on something that I know really well. Plus, I can park my car next to the building, which I never can do ever, 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 ever. This is a really fun time of year because as we go from like Thanksgiving into Christmas, there's kind of a weird tradition in my family where there's this carnival that comes to Austin uh, every year at that time. And it's one of those carnivals where they show up for like two or three weeks and then they're done and they go somewhere else. Uh, and they have all sorts of cool stuff like all these rides that were set up in, you know, probably just a few hours and then will be torn down in just a few hours and thrown on a truck and they'll go off to the next city. And they have all the midway games. Like there's, we could throw the dart at a balloon and win a prize. You can spray the gun full of water into something. They have all that fun carnival stuff and tons of carnival food like funnel cakes and fried Oreos, which I didn't even know was a thing. I have to admit, I tried a fried Twinkie and I always make fun of people that vape because I'm never sure if people who are vaping are vaping ironically. But then I find out that some people who vaped ironically to start with are now addicted to vaping. Well, I went and bought a fried Twinkie because I thought having a fried Twinkie would be really funny and ironic. And now it's entirely possible that I'm addicted to fried Twinkies because that was one of the most amazing things I've ever eaten in my entire life. I'm dead serious. If you have a chance to eat a fried Twinkie, you have a mandate to do that. When you take my kids to a carnival like this, that's always a negotiation with your mom of, you know, putting them in danger. But, you know, the argument that I can make is sometimes you gotta take risks in order to do things that are worthwhile, things that are fun in this case. And that got me thinking about the risks that we take as a company, you know, because when you start something that's entertainment based or anything at all online, there's a huge risk factor to it. Something is considered a risk when you can fail at it or you can lose something that you already have. You're putting something you've got at risk for the sake of essentially something new. And I think in a lot of aspects of life, it's very easy to look back and identify everything that didn't work as a risk because it didn't work. But actually, I'm, I'm really proud of the stuff that we've done in the past that were big risks that we took that worked out really well. I mean, just starting the company in general, making online video and posting it up for free at a time when really nobody else was doing anything like that, that was a huge risk unto itself. Uh, but also, you know, later on when we were pretty comfortable, we didn't just sit around making the one show uh, that was a success. We branched out to things like Achievement Hunter and then took a really, I think, wild risk on a show like Ruby because, you know, we didn't produce anime. Nobody was really kind of doing this thing in the US uh, that we wanted to try. And, uh, you know, it's, and one of the big things for us in starting Ruby was of course Monty had this great idea and he was a huge talent. We wanted to develop a show around him. But also one of the things that we discovered over time with Red vs. Blue is because RBB is essentially eight characters that all look the same and they're just slightly different colors. Some of them not even really that different. Uh, all of the comedy in the show had to be essentially delivered via dialogue. And so what that meant was that RBB as it grew, it became this kind of global phenomenon, but only in countries where people spoke English. America, Canada, Australia, UK, those are our big markets. And you can see like, that's why we have 
RTX events in Australia, that's why you have RTX events in London, and whenever we were doing well in those English-speaking countries, we always wondered why other countries, even if they really, really liked video games, Japan as an example, why they didn't embrace RVB. And it's just because sometimes that written humor doesn't translate to other cultures. And so when we looked at Red vs. Blue, uh, we, we considered it to be a uh, sci-fi fantasy animated comedy. And when we approached Ruby as a new show, you know, we were trying to figure out ways, how can we take this risky thing and still make it appealing to lots of people? Um, so we basically essentially changed one of those aspects for the new show, which is we made a sci-fi fantasy animated action piece. And of course, you know, Ruby has comedic elements and very dramatic elements as well, but essentially at its core, uh, the thing that draws people to it, because of its creator Monty, is the action and the choreography of the fight scenes and the world that they've built around that. And I'm happy to say that is a risk that paid off for us. It didn't pay off right away. The first season of Ruby was, uh, how do I put this? It was not as well received as the later seasons were. That's probably the nicest way to say that. And so as that show grew over the years in popularity, uh, one of the things we saw right away is how it was very quickly embraced in Japan. So while it wasn't overnight, uh, that effort that we made in order to break into other markets that were non-English speaking country was very quickly paid off by Ruby. The best example of that is that Warner Brothers in Japan picked up Ruby for distribution there. So it's nice when a risk pays off, when you invest a lot into something, both money, resources, and your time into something, you want it to pay off. And yet risk is scary. You know, you're trying something new typically, uh, or you're heading in a new direction. And those kinds of things, I mean, it can be daunting because you don't know how it's gonna work out. But ultimately, that's what makes the best decisions of your life when you can leap into something and say, I wanna give this a try, I have faith in it, and I think this can work. And even outside of the context of Rooster Teeth, um, before we started this company, all of us, all the original people, we started a number of different websites. There were movies that I worked on with Matt and Joel, uh, websites that I worked on with Gus and Jeff. You know, there was lots of different things that we tried before we found something that worked. And so it's easy for us now to look back at these, you know, five or six idiots that crammed into a bedroom to start this thing and say, okay, that was a smart idea. That was good. That was something that paid off. But there was a lot of other things that we had to do and fail in order to get to the point where we can make rooster teeth. It wasn't just something that we could do on our first try, and it certainly wasn't. Even though it might seem that way because from the perspective of somebody who knows about rooster teeth, they didn't know us before that. So it seems like our first thing, and it wasn't. It wasn't at all. We took risks and failed on things many, many times, but we always took something away from it, and that always led us to something else. But honestly, at some point in my life, I had to look at myself as a past version of a future me. And I don't know if that makes sense, but I always thought about what I would look back and think about myself at this point in my life. Would I look back and think about a person who wasted our time? Or would I look back and think about someone who's like, how did this person get all of this stuff done? How did they know that this was gonna work? So in the future, when I look back at the past version of me, at the person that I am today, that's the kind of person that I wanna remember. And yeah, I might take some risks that don't work. That's really, really likely when you're taking a risk. But even those risks, even those failures over time, in a way, they almost become as important to you as your successes. And it's hard to see that when you're in the middle of a failure, but those really hard times in life when you're struggling with something, I'm not talking about trauma here, trauma is different. I'm talking about when you're struggling, you're failing at something, as long as you're taking something away from it, those moments will become important to you. They will become as important as the successes in your life. Trust me. But risks lead you to new things, and new things are fun. And one of the new things that I did in this last year was started this vlog, and it was a nice way to have a conversation. I got to have a ton of adventures. I got to meet Ellie and start her on her apocalyptic journey, and uh, it's been a lot of fun. But I did say when I started this thing that I wasn't going to do it for longer than a year. That was that was my goal was to get to a year, and we're coming up very quickly on a year here at the end of 2017. So I'm sad to say that. Bernie's vlog is coming to an end, and I know there's been a lot of jokes about Bernie's vlog not really being Bernie's vlog, but that was kind of the intention all along. I mean, Jeff called it back in RTX in July.
quick answer to your question. I always thought vlogging was just people sitting in a bedroom talking to a webcam. I had no idea that it had shifted into what it is now. But uh, yeah, so that's, the, that's why I got into it. And historically at Rooster Teeth, I like to like start something, do it for like three or four months, and then hand it off to somebody else, and hopefully it turns into something big. And I think that's the point that I'm at with vlogging right now. So who are you turning your vlog over to? Somebody who's not 44. How about that? <laughs> still, still gonna be called Bernie's blog though, that's weird. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks for taking my question, guys. For me, the last vlog will be sometime in the next few weeks. I don't know exactly when. I don't really know what the future of the vlog has in store for itself. I really don't know what Ellie's gonna do uh, with her apocalyptic training or how she'll keep you up to date on that, but I'm sure we'll figure something out. For me, I am gonna take this time that I normally spend with the vlog and I'm gonna use it uh, to focus on a new project. This is something I've been talking about with Matt for years, and I think right now is the time when we should be making that project, and so, I'm super excited to get back to it. And the vlog, while it never really, I don't think really took off, it was a great way for me to reconnect with shooting and editing and storytelling on a very minimalist basis with just me or just Ellie or Ashley helping me shoot. It was just a way to like reconnect with those core fundamentals of filmmaking. And I'm gonna take that forward into 2018 on my new project as I make another risk. Wish me luck. So if you have any ideas for the last few vlogs of what you'd like to see, what do you want to talk about, let me know. Put it in the comments, do the thing, whatever, Twitter, Reddit, whatever you got. Let me know what you want to see over the course of the next couple of weeks. And hey, thank you for watching everybody. This has been a lot of fun to make. I do have some more stuff coming and I actually do have some surprises. But uh, I just want to let you know, thanks for sticking around for a year. It was a fun year. I hope it was for you too.